welcome to the first ever collaboration between Confabulation Storytelling and the Goethe Institute Montreal. And we are live here at the Goethe Institute in Montreal. Well, some of us are live. Um, some of us are far away on Zoom and others are far away on, on, on video, but some of us are here live. And it is a mix of um, excitement, delight, and uh, kind of nerve-wracking. But wow, is it nice to see familiar faces smiling. Well, more like eyes smiling, mostly. So I know we're in a few different time zones. So for some people, it's a matinee. For others, it's bedtime. For us, it's cocktail hour. And the theme tonight is mistakes, errors, flops, fiascos, feller. Why do mistakes have such a bad rap? Like it's the one thing that we all really have in common. Birth, mistakes, death. We all make mistakes. Like I've, at my age, I've probably made thousands of mistakes, thousands of mistakes under my belt. You know, that's quite something. And hopefully, I've learned from at least half of them. And I guess that's the point. I guess that's the trick. Tonight, the storytellers and the stories will run the gamut from little mistakes, subtle mistakes, big mistakes, catastrophic, humbling, enlightening, the gamut. Before we get started, I would like to introduce Michael Krell from the Goethe Institute. Hi everyone, guten Tag, bonjour. My name is uh, Michael Krell. I work as a web editor for the Goethe Institute in Montreal. And I'm also one of the editors of our web magazine, Fehler, which is, of course, a uh, mistake in German. So earlier this year, we asked ourselves, uh, how do innovations happen? And how does new stuff come into the world? And uh, one of the best answers to that question is, of course, by mistake, by chance. So we built a website. We dedicated uh, uh, our uh, website to the subject of mistakes things that happened that weren't uh, intended as, uh, uh, as they came out in the end and uh, which led to great innovations and funny things sometimes. So tonight, streaming live from the Montreal, uh, Goethe Institute Montreal, uh, we're hosting our first ever uh, Fehler live event. And uh, well, Deb said the rest. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the evening and the stories that we've prepared for you. Our first storyteller of the evening is Francesca Esquera. She is a confabulation producer. Um, she is a writer, a performer, and um, pajamas is one thing that she's uh, been wearing a lot lately. So she's got a fabulous outfit for you tonight. Francesca. Okay, so uh, in order for me to tell you this story, there's something that you need to understand about me first. And when I say that thing, it's going to sound like a lot, but I promise you this is an objective fact that is completely necessary for understanding the story, okay? And that objective fact is that as a child, I was adorable. Whew, that's a lot. A well, lot to say that out loud, you know, I mean, we all have our crosses to bear, and that was mine. And because of that, at eight years old, I am asked to be a part of my cousin Georgie's wedding. And not only am I going to be the flower girl at this wedding, but I'm going to be the only kid that's there at all. And my cousin Georgie, he lives in the U.S., but we're related through Canadian channels except his bride-to-be is just about as red, white, and blue as they come. Her parents, for the week leading up to the wedding, had rented this massive mansion on Cape Cod overlooking the water. And I don't know if you know what Cape Cod is like, but it's a place where it's socially acceptable to say things like, Hi, society, or um, uh, my great-great-granddaddy invented a pocket change. <laughs> and so even though my parents are going to be here at this wedding, unlike me, they're not in the bridal party. So for a week leading up to the big day, I have to attend all of these 
rehearsals and dinners and long speeches and practice runs and gift giving and it's exhausting. And the most exhausting part of it is the way that adults talk to me. Like one second they're like, all right, Jimmy, you son of a bitch, I'll catch you on the golf course, you bastard. <laughs> and then they see me and they're like, oh my, what little American girl doll do we have here? How scrum diddly umptious she is. It, it's weird and, and I don't like this. And so on the day of the wedding, I decide that I just want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be the only kid at this wedding. So I promote myself from flower girl to junior bridesmaid with a floral agenda. I get my hair and my makeup done with all of the other bridesmaids and they let me soak up all of their gossip. Like, like did you know that the bride used to experiment in college? And I think that that is so cool because now she's a lawyer and so that means that she must use like science stuff to win big in the courtroom. And it's like in these few hours spent with the bridesmaids, I grow from little girl to debutante. The wedding ceremony happens out in the garden without a hitch, just like I suspected. She walks, they kiss, hurrah, the end. And then it's time for the reception. Yeah. And the reception's happening inside right. the Right, thank mansion. you, yeah. And I know that receptions usually start off with a dance between the father and the bride, so that's what happens, but when the song ends, the bride whisks me onto the dance floor, and even though I'm not actually a debutante, I'm not really a junior bridesmaid, I'm not even American, I know exactly what to do. And it turns out that that is the right decision because moments later, the dance floor is just flooded with wedding guests. And it's there, in this mansion in Cape Cod, that I learn just how easy it is to pretend you know the words to songs that you don't actually know the words to. You know, like, um, right? Just like ABBA. And it's like on this dance floor, I arrive. I grow up. And at the end of the night, this woman that I don't know, she comes up to me and she says like, oh my God, you're so adorable, blah, blah, blah. And I smile and nod as adorable children are trained to do. And then she says, and if anyone tells you, you went the wrong way, you say, I go my own way. And I have no idea what she means by that. But I suspect that this is what the bridesmaids are referring to when they say that somebody is trashed. And frankly, I get it. It's hard when there's only room for one star at the show, right? <laughs> a year later, I get a photo album in the mail with a photo of the bride and groom on the cover. And I'm so excited because I know that in this photo album, there is evidence of my night as a celebutante. I go through it and I get to a page with four pictures, okay, one of each bridesmaid walking down the aisle. Except the last picture, where I'm supposed to be, there's no one, it's just, just the empty aisle. Like, I was in this wedding, right? Like I was the flower girl slash junior bridesmaid at this wedding, right? I try to take myself back to that moment, okay? It's a year ago, I'm in Cape Cod, it smells amazing. The water is there, people are there, all eyes are on me. I'm about to take my first step down the aisle. And that's when I notice a beautiful arrangement of flower petals already scattered down the aisle. And I think, well, me and my basket of flower petals, we're not gonna do a better job than they already did, so what am I doing here? I think about weddings and I think about the bride and how it's supposed to be so special and so perfect and she wears white and it's like virginal and pure and flowers, those are virginal and pure, I think, maybe if that's what those words mean, I don't know. And so I come to this very mature conclusion that I'm, I'm not worthy of this aisle. This aisle is for the bride. And instead, I make my way to the front by just going around the whole group, all the wedding guests, I look back at the photo in the photo album and I see, just on the outskirts of all the action, a little turquoise puff. That's me. That's the flower girl. And I'm so humiliated. 
I'm so humiliated because, because even though a star was born on the dance floor that night, I failed at the one job I was supposed to do. I failed as a flower girl. And then a voice comes to me. If anyone tells you, you went the wrong way. You say, I go my own way. Thank you. <laughs>
and we're like and then said well it's still it's like according to rules we said but look our rules were that it has to be not more than 20 centimeters in every dimension and they were like well no you said like it was 200 centimeters in every dimension it was like 10 times that much and we're like no and then we went online and we looked for the rules and guess what we found out it was actually 200 centimeters so the kids were right and the poor little kids made a huge structure like two times their size and uh, they dragged it all the way to the seventh floor and <laughs> we were like we were expecting some tiny figures and we made this mistake and they made this huge structure and they dragged it all the way so it was funny it was also like we felt like oh my god poor kids they had to do it and they had to drag it all along and then we really we made this mistake of like 10 times the size and then we were getting many other objects we we're getting smaller objects we were getting larger objects some of them were really cute like some of them were super cute many kids just made wonderful animals like there were a lot of hedgehogs and there were some sea creatures like a lot of them made crabs or octopus or some other and um, we have a wonderful collection of their photos and we still have some of these animals in our office in the office of Goethe Institute in St. Petersburg but that tiny mistake of a digit like we put extra zero we just added a super digit we realized we made this little kids work so much more but they can also somehow create something which is much bigger than they were and that was quite an experience just imagine making an object which would be two times your size and just making them with your hands well that was something special anyway it was funny it was only something rewarding for everyone and it was quite an experience and that was probably one of the cutest mistakes we've ever made the sunlight is being concentrated through the glass straight into the food so it will not no Next storyteller is live, live in the other room. Sara Morley is a video artist, a documentarian, and the creative director of design Post Image. She's been capturing and telling other people's stories and moving pictures for as long as she can remember. Tonight, she shares a tale about when she first came to Montreal. Sara Morley. I've been making pictures for as long as I can remember. My mum used to cover the kitchen table with newspaper and bring out pots of paint. She'd say, it's painting time. I had a slide where I was doing two drawings at once, drawing circles with a pencil in each hand. My mother encouraged me to express myself and I lived in a universe that was magical of her creation until I was seven. And then she died of cancer. My world collapsed and I went into survival mode. But I kept on drawing. At 19, I was in Brighton and trying to decide whether to stay in Thatcher's Britain or accept Concordia University's scholarship and come to Montreal to go to art school. I chose Concordia and Montreal. I rented a small flat with two students who were also uh, in the arts. There were a kitchen and two rooms one was our studio, and the other was our bedroom. We slept three to a room with three single beds. A rat lived between the floors, and we heard him scratching at night. My first friend was Katja. She was from Hamburg. We both were in the same classes and we had a penchant for drawing skeletons. 
She had her three children, her first at 18. We became kindred spirits, and I soon became part of her Montreal clan. One night, I went to the Rising Sun to watch a reggae band. I was sporting a black slip and combat boots. A man with a shaved head wearing a kilt was dancing by the speaker. I joined him on the dance floor. Afterwards, we chatted and decided to meet up at the Deer Garden, a local Chinese resto. It was busy and loud with bright fluorescent lights and taxidermy deer heads on the walls. We chatted easily and drank endless cups of tea. His family was from the UK and we were both anarchists, or at least we had anarchic tendencies. We walked across town back to his place. He lived in a ramshackle flat with his bandmate. It was so drafty that they'd stapled blankets to the wall. We stayed up all night and Ian burned a five dollar bill because it's only money. After that night, we were together. My approach to birth control was a bit loose. I used the rhythm method and only permitted condoms when I was fertile. Or I should say only allowed condoms when I was fertile. It worked well until uh, I missed a period. I went for a test and at 21 I was pregnant. Ian and I were surprised but pleased. If Kasia could do it then so could we. And we never even considered not having the child. Ian's band was called Failsafe and the gossip columnist described my pregnancy as a failed safe. We were very amused. We moved into a rent-controlled flat. I had $400 in the bank and we thought, great, we've got a buffer. The day came and I had a 36-hour labor. I did Tai Chi during the contractions and refused all painkillers. The doctor spoke French and so the first words I uttered as my baby emerged were oh, une jeune fille. After 24 hours they sent me home. Anna was sleeping in a bassinet and I looked at her and my eyes filled with tears. She's so lovely, but what are we going to do? We don't have a clue how to look after this baby. We decided to fully integrate her into our daily lives. We strapped her to us and took her everywhere we went. I went back to school part-time and took her to some of my classes. We were sleep deprived but happy, and Anna was a delight. We called her Buddha Baby. We had lots of help. Our friend Tori was like a third parent, and Katja provided all the baby paraphernalia we could ever need. But in the eyes of society, I had made a mistake. That child should have a hat. Wipe her nose. <sighs> she looks so pale. The older women were quick to comment and did not keep their judgment to themselves. Clearly, someone with green hair and lots of piercings should not be a mother. I've lived my life a lot like I approach making a drawing. I never have a plan. 
I make it up as I go along and go with it. If I make a mark that I don't like, I scratch it out or I turn it into something frightening and beautiful. Cheers to our mistakes. Cheers. Thanks, Sarah. And it also has me wondering, like, it's cocktail hour and for some reason I don't have a drink because that was sort of the whole thing, but there was so much to do before the show that I, anyway, I'm going to get my drink in between like stories now. And now we're going to go to Germany. We're going to go to a video that Christopher Klobel has uh, put together for us. Um, Christopher is a German novelist, a playwright, and a scriptwriter. And uh, he's going to share a story about um, mistakes and food, food-related mistakes. Um, so welcome, Christopher Klöbel. Hello, my name is Christopher Klöbel. I'm a writer from Germany. And I'm married uh, to Saskia Jane, who's also a writer from India. Um, we met 10 years ago in a very small pizza place. And since then, we've been spending our time between Berlin and Delhi, usually. But of course, this year, everything is a little bit different. And therefore, we couldn't go to India. Um, that's why we are here, stuck in Berlin. And I'm stuck in my daughter's uh, room, as you might be able to see. Um, she is at the kindergarten right now. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to make this recording. And I wanted to talk a little bit about making mistakes or having misconceptions in an intercultural relationship and I specifically want to talk about food because this was the first big issue Saskia and I had in our relationship better the, the first big fight I have to say and uh, it just happened really surprisingly in the middle of a conversation where I more or less conveyed to her that I felt well European cuisine is obviously much more diverse than the South Asian one. And Saskia was shocked by me saying that because she felt that obviously the South Asian cuisine is much more diverse. I mean, she said, like, think of all the things like Golkapas and Chule Batur and um, Idlis and uh, even something like Pan. And I replied to that, I mean, come on, think of all the things in, you can get in Europe from schnitzel or uh, ragu fin or, or fish and chips or spaghetti. And, and where I come from uh, in Bavaria, very delicious dish called Weisswurst, uh, white sausages. So, um, and I said, you can't even get a lot of meat, meaty things in South Asia for obvious reasons. And she replied, no, no, of, of course you can get almost all the meat you want. You just have to know who to ask. Plus, there's lots of meat which isn't that good in Europe anyway, like uh, mutton, for example. It's hard to get and it's not nearly as good as, uh, for example, in some places in Delhi. And yeah, the fight went on for quite a while um, until at some point we realized that um, maybe the most diverse cuisine in the world is the Indian one and the European one. Um, although today, many years later, I, uh, I have to admit kind of that I think the better cuisine is actually the Indian one, but please don't tell anyone. Um, what I really got from all this, uh, from this uh, discussion or fight, is that I realized how much more important food is for people from South Asia than for people from where I'm from. I mean, here people are okay with eating like cold slice of bread in the evening. And um, I realized that eating is not something you do in order to live, but it's almost like living is more something you do in order to eat. That's what Saskia taught me. And not only that, she, she taught me that, like you say in Germany, love goes through the stomach, or love, uh, uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, as you say in English. It's much more than that. It's not only love. It's to, to to anyone. Like you love to the way to a, a person's 
heart, but also to, to friends' heart, to family's heart, is through the stomach. And I think, thanks to Saskia, my world was so widened and I've, I've not only found her and many friends, thanks to South Asian cuisine, but I found a whole new family in India and I consider myself very lucky and I'm very grateful to South Asian food. Oh, fascinating. Eight, nine, ten. Let's do ten shots. They all came out the top. I need to cover the top. And now we're back to live here at the Goethe Institute in Montreal. And our next two storytellers are going to introduce. I'm going to introduce two in a row just to mix it up. And Smriti Bansal is the next storyteller. She's a communication specialist, a pop culture scholar, and a storyteller. She is on the confabulation team, and um, she performs and helps other performers to find and perfect their stories. Lucas Rowland is the communications coordinator at Confabulation, and he is from southern Louisiana. Um, so I'm thrilled to have the two of them here. And so first, we're going to hear from Smriti Bansal, and then Lucas Rowland. So first, Smriti. Picture this. It's me and my friend and we're sitting on a bench outside of Drexel University in Philadelphia. It's 2 a.m. and it is so cold that I can't feel my fingers. My friend keeps going up to Drexel students, but every time she approaches them, they slowly back away. And you know what? I can't blame them. Both of us look pretty strung out. Meanwhile, I am like texting on my phone and I'm like texting my friend John and I'm saying to him, like, looks like we're gonna be spending the night on the bench. Hopefully we won't freeze to death, LOL. And John texts back saying, wait, I think I might be able to help you. Now most stories are structured in this way. You have the introduction, the inciting incident that gets, that gets things going, the climax and the resolution. Right now, we're at the climax. But before we get into the resolution, let me give you a bit of context. Let me take you through the inciting incident that led up to this moment. Now, my friend and I are 19. We live in New York, and we are obsessed with the band Arctic Monkeys. And so we decide to go see their concert at Philadelphia, which is only three hours away from New York. In order to do this, we come up with a foolproof, but most importantly, budget-friendly plan. We decide that we're going to take the 4 p.m. bus from New York, get to Philadelphia by 7 p.m., just in time for the concert, and after, we would only have to hang out in the city for about an hour and a half until we take the 1 a.m. bus back to New York City. Um, and by doing this, we would avoid having spent a single dollar in staying at an expensive Airbnb. And so, according to plan, we get to Philadelphia by 7 p.m., we watch the concert and it is amazing. And afterwards, we get a ride to the bus station. But 1 a.m., it comes and it goes and there's no bus. And so we check our tickets to make sure that we're in the right location. And that's when we realize our mistake. We had misread the ticket. The bus was at 12, not 1 a.m. And not only had we missed the bus, the next one, the earliest one that we could get on, wouldn't be here until 6 a.m. And of course, because when it rains, it truly pours, it had now started to snow. And so, of course, we panic, we panic, we panic, but we're also 19, and that means that a mistake is not a mistake. It's just an opportunity for adventure. And so, we make another plan. We decide to walk on over to Drexel University, where we figure that, you know, like, we'll be able to sneak into one of the buildings, and we'd have to sleep on the floor, but at least we'll be warm. Wrong. Turns out that Drexel has pretty sick, strict security. And so no matter how hard we tried, we could not get into any of their buildings. And that is how we ended up freezing our butts off opposite the university building. And just when we thought, this is it, it's 
night on the bench, right at the climax of the story, I get that text from John. Now, it turns out that John had been able to get in touch with his friend Steve, a student at Drexel. And Steve, now our guardian angel, had graciously agreed to host us for the night, giving us, giving me, a satisfying resolution to the story. And so we walk on over to Steve's place and turns out that our guardian angel is a short, muscular dude who lives in a frat house. So like when we get there, like Steve seems to be in the process of like hazing pledges, five shirtless dudes who are shivering in the cold and also seem to be regretting their decision to join Greek life. And when Steve sees us, he barely grunts at us as he leads us to his room, a spacious man cave uh, whose decor I can only now describe as being beer themed. And so, you know, like he tells us to get settled in, uh, you know, be, get comfortable. I won't be back until tomorrow morning. I got work to do with these pledges. And, you know, we nod, uh, grateful to have a place to stay uh, and too afraid to ask <laughs> by what he means by work. And at that point in the night, we are so tired that everything just feels surreal and funny and so we settle down for the night giggling and like trying to fall asleep under the bright lights of Steve's several neon beer signs. <laughs> Morning comes and you know Steve is still not there and while we're not able to say goodbye to him we are able to catch the 6 a.m. bus back to New York City. Now, I don't know if you can tell this about me, but I spend a lot of my time thinking about story structures, uh, especially these days, because if I were to apply a story structure to my life in the pandemic, it wouldn't be a cresting wave of like exciting, inciting incidents, crazy climaxes and satisfying resolutions like the one in the story that I just shared with you. No, it would just be a boring flat line punctuated by my infrequent visits to the grocery store. And so I find myself spending a lot of my time just fantasizing about all the dumb things I'm gonna do in the future, all the possible stories that could emerge, that could be prompted by inciting incidents, probably dumb mistakes that I'm gonna make. They're gonna open up windows to new adventures. In other words, I, like to picture myself again and again back on that 6 a.m. bus from Philadelphia watching the sun rise over New York City. Thank you for tuning in. So, I'm lying on a mattress on my bedroom floor looking up at the bedroom ceiling. It's April 2020 and I'm going over every mistake I have ever made in every relationship I've ever been in. So, you know, we're in isolation. I'm in isolation with my roommate, who I broke up with about a month ago. Um, it was just one of those communication incompatibilities, right? Things happen. Um, I have to talk about my feelings a lot, and that's not really his style, so... Uh, things just sort of... I wasn't getting the emotional connection I needed, he wasn't getting the physical affection, and, uh, you know, we were just... we were making each other miserable, so it was time to acknowledge that. So what we had done when we had moved into this apartment is that we had taken my mattress and his bed base and put them together. So inevitably, when it came time to separate into two, two different bedrooms, uh, the bed base went and my mattress ended up on the floor. Not a great look for your early 30s. My lower back did not thank me for that. But, you know, I was just, I was waking up, I was pulling aside the curtain to look at the weather. Not that it mattered, because I wasn't going outside. I was just going to go back to sleep. I was sleeping 12 hours a day at this time, when I wasn't busy reflecting on my failures. You know how you know something before you actually know it? But then, you know, with life's old rhythm, everything was too busy, or you were too stressed, or you were you know, killing yourself, trying to make the money to pay the bills, to keep yourself in the apartment. So you, you had no time to confront these truths hidden in your brain. It would bubble up sometimes in a song lyric, but I had to push that aside because I knew, I knew if I looked at the truth that I would collapse and I could not afford to do that. So the truth came and got me in a dream. 
In my dream, I'm lying in bed and a figure is, is kind of cuddling up to me and uh, seeking some affection and I grab this figure by the throat. I wake up in terror. This is like one of the worst intrusive thoughts. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would, I would never. But then the more I think about it, the more I understand that I am. I am strangling my own life. So I decided to admit the truth. Uh, and say that, you know, I think we would be happier if we were no longer seeing each other, which I believed. Um, but then we're left with, you know, me in a pandemic thinking, well, look, here I am living with an ex again. Um, and as before, I mean, that was an ex-husband, but <laughs> as before, the communication problems that trouble a romantic relationship, they just don't magically disappear uh, when the relationship changes. So here we were, related by a common space, me and my ex-boyfriend with the bed separated, still unable to get along, stuck together in isolation. But as time went on, uh, we were able to sort of find our rhythm and, and get along and make things work, but this time as roommates and the pressure felt off. And I started to become you know, more comfortable going outside. So I started, I started seeing someone new, physically distant at first, which it's, uh, it was a particular new little reality to discover how, um, <laughs> you know when you really wanna kiss someone but there's a pandemic happening all around you and it's your first meeting so you wanna be responsible and you just, you, you don't. But over time we got more comfortable. Um, I started to think of him as like my, my pandemic boyfriend. And as we got closer and then we got closer, um, two things became apparent, one, this might have some potential. And two, I have got to stop sleeping on a mattress on the floor. Uh, I, my back is killing me, and it's just, it's not a very adult look. So we go to Ikea. Now I kind of put all my potential partners through the Ikea test, um, probably because I want to reenact, you know, some dorky romantic comedy. But really, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good test. If you can go out in public and not get stressed out and pull each other's hair out in the bathroom uh, displays, whatever that means to you, uh, then you'll be fine, usually. Only this time, there's people who don't wear their masks over their nose and children running amok and coming too close to me, and I'm just sort of like <laughs> freaking out. But he can recognize when my anxiety is starting to spike, and he puts a hand on the back of my neck, and I just, I just, I just relax. So we make it through Ikea. I come home, I assemble my bed, I lift my mattress up off the floor, and I look at this thing and it's like, hey, an adult sleeps here. I even got a duvet, my very first. Uh, getting it in the cover is a nightmare, but uh, I'm, I'm learning. So now as I'm lying in bed staring at the ceiling, this time with my arm around someone I love, and we're thinking about moving in together, and I'm wondering, is that gonna be the same mistake though? Uh, I've done it once before, I'm in this situation now, but you know what, what helps is that, you know, one, he's a completely different person, and two, after all this reflecting on every mistake that I've ever made, maybe I'm a different person too, or at least I have a very long list of things not to do next time. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter, because with my arm around him, and I just feel so safe and comfortable, and it feels, it feels right, and it feels like home, and no matter what happens, I am ready to take this risk. Thank you, Lucas. And look at me, I'm in the other room now just to mix it up and Lucas was where I was. And uh, anyway, again, it's, uh, we're, we're live at the, uh, the Goethe Institute in Montreal and it's a uh, first time collaboration between Confabulation and the Goethe and um, hopefully there'll be more. We've also got a webcasting team, and I'd like to thank Joël and Martin for setting everything up and uh, switching between all of us, the close, the far away, and, uh, and the videos. And um, we've got a little gem of a video now, something that's a little bit different from anything we've been doing tonight. Um, Okwiri Odur was born in Nairobi, Kenya. Her short story, My Father's Head, won the 2014 Kane Prize for African Writing, as well as the 2013 Short Story Day, Africa's Feast, Famine, and Potluck Story Contest. Um, she's also uh, directed literary festivals, and, um, and here she is with, um, with a beautiful little video. Eat your greens, virtue. 
palm your hair, start your blouse virtue, keep your ankles tight. Who are you trying to show those knobbly knees, those shattering thighs, those shameful secrets that seep through your polka dot knickers? Now eat your greens but not all of them. Don't you know the men don't like too much chob? And read your books but not all of them. Don't you know the men don't like the smart elect girls? The frilling breech girls, the full of sass and colic and gas girls. Sit in the sun, virtue, but not for long. Look, you're already cool coloured and half ugly. No use tossing all your chances in the wind. Didn't I tell you to perm your hair? Where are you going with that field of fodder sprouting on your scalp? What do you want the neighbours to think? What do you want Mama Delfinus to say? Do you want her to gloat on account she got herself a yellow-skinned daughter, a brown-eyed daughter, a daughter worth her weight in gold? Don't show your nails. You aren't a goat. Don't smack your lips like that. Are you a call girl? To be honest, I don't know any more with how you act these days, running around all footloose and dirty like a hanging ham. How many times must I tell you to fasten yourself up like the good Catholic girl we're trying to raise? Say your Hail Marys and your Glory Bees. Listen here, Virtue, I'm talking to you. Look me in the eye, Virtue, and I'm talking to you. Lord, what did I do to deserve a daughter like this one? See how she looks me in the eye when I talk to her. See that insolent glint, that wayward grin, that wrinkled nose. A horse-toothed slut if I ever saw one. Hush now, low your voice. What do you want your father to think? Hush now, you're acting like a jealous mistress. So tell me, is that it? You want your father all to yourself now, virtue? You want him to leave me for you, virtue? Be a good girl and say the apostle's creed. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died and was buried. Don't twist your mouth like that. Are you a rubber band? Don't fill your cheeks with air. Are you a puffer fish? To be honest, I don't know anymore with how you act these days, running around with a chip on your shoulder. Look here, I'm your mother, I owe you nothing. Look here, I'm your mother, you owe me everything. I'm your gift from God above, so don't go saying qua 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 and don't go saying I never warned you. See, I see funzo na mamaya, funzo na limwengu. See, the world is a callous teacher, it will never coddle you the way I do. But you never coddle me. What do you mean I never coddle you? So what am I doing right this moment if not coddling you, if not treating you like you're the virgin, most prudent, virgin, most venerable, mirror of justice, seed of wisdom when you're nothing but a slot? Look, I could be poking those impertinent eyes out. Look, I could be scanning you for letting the eggs burn on the stove, wasting a good meal. You think that money grows on trees? Look, I could be showing you what happens to girls like you. They wind up with their faces splattered all over the news. They wind up bled to death in an alleyway with their guts ripped open. They wind up with a hanger sticking out the secret place. They wind up telephoning the mother saying, Mama, are you there? I'm dying. Please come and hold me. Please bring Scott's emulsion. I'll drink cod liver oil if it means you'll love me again. But I will never telephone you. What are you mumbling for? Open your mouth and speak with your chest. Lord help me, why is your mouth still open? Are you talking back again? See if I don't slap the sass off your yellow teeth. Now go to confession and tell the priest all the ways you injure your poor mother's heart. Start with this one. You sitting there just there, mouth hanging open like it got torn up by barbed wire. I know you're thinking something filthy. Is it that tawny faced boy again? The one that said hello darling to you as we walked down the street? I know it can't be him or else you're denser than I thought. I know it can't be him after that whipping your father gave you. Hakia Mungu Virtue, are you really thinking about that little louse again? Thank you very much, O'Query. Thank you. The next storyteller is Michelle Lux. She's a pedagogical consultant, a storyteller, and a producer here at Confabulation. She tells stories regularly, she helps others prepare and tell their stories. I have been co-teaching the Story Lab, the Confabulation Story Lab workshop with her for these past six weeks. And uh, as Matt Goldberg likes to say, an all-around wonderful person. So, Michelle Lux. It's a rainy COVID September night in New York City, and I am riding a Bixie-type bicycle on a tunnel underneath Central Park as fast as I can. Somehow I thought this would be the easiest way to get from the west side to my car, which is parked by the East River, but it is dark and echoey and cars splash by me and I swear there are rats. And there's a woman across the way who keeps yelling, what are you doing here? <laughs> what am I doing here? It has been a surreal six weeks in New York City. 
My dad, who thought he had COVID or maybe the flu, was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. And his doctor told us, your father is a very sick man. He may not live through the month. So my sister and my niece and I move into an apartment down the hall to help out. To help out with hospital beds and Pedialyte and poop and adult diapers and lemon jello because we can't eat, he, he refuses to eat anything else. And it's not all that bad. It, part of it is bittersweet like his last walk to get a chocolate bar, and his last bite of chocolate, his last martini, his last words, and then in the hospital, his last breath. So after seven days of crazy after-death work, it's our last night, and my sister Coco is going to make a huge dinner, because all we've been living on is pretzels, and we're gonna drink a martini and toast my dad, and all I need to do is get my car from the east side parking lot over to the west side where we're staying. And I arrive at the car, and I am soaking wet because it's raining, and I try to turn it on, and it won't turn on, and it's not like a ring, 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 old time car sound that won't turn on. It's a click, 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 Blink, 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 the lights are blinking, system error is showing on the, the computer, and I have no idea what I've done to our new car. And so I call my partner, who is 600 kilometers away in Montreal, and I put him on FaceTime, and I show him what's happening, and I don't like his ideas at all. He wants me to get out the manual. I say it's nighttime, I don't even have my glasses. He suggests call AAA, why don't you get a taxi to boost you? Ray, it's not that type of problem. There is a system error here. And then I start crying. And he takes some pity on me and says, all right, just hold on and let me see what I can do. And my tears, I'm feeling so sorry for myself because I am so hungry. All I've been eating for six weeks are pretzels, and that's all I had today. And I, I, I don't know exactly what to, to do here, and it just feels like the dam is about to break, and then it breaks. And the tears come, and they are dripping down, and now I am sobbing, open mouth sobs. And I know I'm not just crying for the car. I really miss my dad, and I also just been the hardest six weeks and I've made so many decisions I can't make another one. Somebody knocks on the window because I have been rocking that car with tears. Are you okay? Just tell them yeah it's just a car system error, just a breakdown like I'm breaking down. My sister calls, hello, dinner's ready, so are the martinis, we're just waiting for you. And I tell her, don't just go ahead without me. I think I'm gonna be in here all night. I've broken the car, like I, I, I don't even know if I can lock the doors. I'm crying when Ray comes back to me to tell me the good and bad news. The good news, there's a tow truck coming. The bad news, it looks like it's gonna be a little more than an hour. More than an hour? Do you understand that I am starving? A few minutes later, there's another knock on the window. It's my sister Coco. She took a taxi here, and she opens the door, and she hands me some pretzels, and she says, I want to see you eat one. And as I do, Ray says, do you think you could hand the phone to your sister? And the two of them work out together that they think it is the battery and that, uh, that they, we should call a taxi. And then Coco realizes that right across the street, directly across, there's a huge sign that says garage, and the garage is open. And my sister walks into the garage and comes out with a man who has booster cables, who walks over to the car and puts them on, and the car starts. And he doesn't even charge me after he sees my red and blotchy, completely cried out face. He walks back in, and Coco gets into the car, and she puts her hand on my shoulder and we drive through the rainy city. And I am so thankful to have such a great sister and partner who accept me even when I'm at my lowest, when my battery is completely dead, when I've had system failure. And we go back to the apartment and the martinis are chilled and we toast to my dad 
and we look out over his city for one last night. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And now we're going to Ty Coleman, who has been patiently waiting in the Zoom room all by himself. So thank you for hanging out and, uh, and being with us tonight. Ty's from Baltimore, a seasoned facilitator, comedian, and teacher, black trans, uh, a black genderqueer performer. He is dedicated to building spaces for black, queer, and trans folks to come together and share stories as a mechanism of healing and celebration. Welcome, Ty. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ty, and my ego is not my friend. Now, my ego has gotten me in and out of a lot of situations. For example, my ego was the one that convinced me to grow my hair long. Good things. My ego is also the one that convinced me that my eight-year-old crush, uh, Sally Jenkins, was in love with me. Bad things. My ego is not my friend. It is inconsistent. And it's usually based on the, the doubts, right? It's usually based on those doubts. It's sensitive. My ego is not my friend. The number one reason my ego is not my friend is that he prevents me from asking for help. My ego convinces me all the time, Ty, you've got this, which in a lot of ways can be great. When I'm on stage, it's very good to have a good ego because I go on stage sometimes frightened. My ego says, go ahead and do it. But sometimes it's very important to ask for help. And so this is a situation I found myself in seven years ago when I first started teaching young people. Now, mind you, I had no experience as a teacher of kids, especially not second grade, especially not seven-year-olds, and especially not in this particular neighborhood. When I started there, as my supervisor tried to give me some tips, some instructions, because here I was an intern starting to teach, I stopped her. I actually put my hand up to her face and told her, actually, I already have a plan. She said, you haven't met these kids. I was like, well, these kids haven't met me. I've already decided what I'm going to do. So thank you so much for your help. But I'm going to go ahead and teach these kids. So it's an after school program. They get out of school. I have a big, positive, happy smile on. I can't wait to teach these second graders all of these wonderful things. Now, if I had listened to my supervisor, I would have known that instead of sitting in the cafeteria waiting for these students, I should have been at their door walking them downstairs. If I had listened to my supervisor, I would have known that I needed to talk to the principal so she knew who the stranger in her, her school was. But I didn't do any of that. Instead, I sat there just like this, and I sat there just like this, for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, to 40 minutes, until finally me and my ego got up, walked to my supervisor and told her, hey, I think your program's canceled today because I don't have any students. She looked at me, she sighed, and she said, there. She didn't say anything, she just pointed. I went to the classroom she was pointing in and there are my students. Now. There was one person watching them, an adult. She was on her phone. So my students were running around the classroom. They were on the desk and they were doing all these things. And it was my job to now get them into homework time. However, I was a stranger. Now, if I was listening to my supervisor, I would have known that when I picked them up from their classrooms, the teacher was going to introduce me. When I would have talked to the principal like I should have, the principal is going to come in and talk to the students and introduce me. But I put my hand up and I told her I had it. So none of those things were in. So here I was, this strange adult, trying to tell this group of students to listen to me. And they had no reason to listen. So it went exactly how you imagine. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon. Uh, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon! Until I just shrieked, they all paused, they looked at me, and they laughed. They laughed heartily because they knew as soon as I yelled like that, that I was completely out of control. 
I don't know how close my supervisor was, but she was close enough. But by the time objects started being thrown at me, she stepped in, she put her hand around my shoulders and said, do you need some help? Luckily, my ego was defeated enough to accept a little bit of help. She walked in, she gave the introduction and she said, now it is time to learn. So you would think after, after that day, after that horrible first day that was rescued only by admitting I need help, that I would now be a different teacher, a more enlightened, open teacher. That is not true. I decided that that 20, that that 20 minute experience was enough to tell me everything I did. So I came to work extra early. I picked them up from class. I talked to the principal. I brought them down and we started homework hour. However, because again, I did not listen. I did not know that I needed to check these students' homework. I did not know that I was supposed to give them extra work. I actually trusted everything a seven-year-old told me about the homework they had to have. Two weeks went by, my supervisor calls me into her office. She sits me down. She says, Ty, I don't wanna let you go, but no one is finishing their homework. And I said, I'm sorry, that's impossible because they told me. And she asked me, Ty, who is they? And I said, my students. She said, the seven-year-olds? I said, yes. She said, the seven-year-olds told you they didn't have any homework for two weeks. And I said, well, yeah, I thought it was odd, but I, you know, I know school has changed. It hasn't changed that much. Because I wanted to be the best friend Ty and everything else and did not listen to any advice the person who'd been working there for 10 years wanted to give me, I had now endangered these students learning. So what did me and my ego did? We overcorrected. So instead of best friend Ty with I'll trust whatever word you do, I was micromanaging Ty. I was in these students' faces, in their homework. You're gonna give me all the homework. I'm gonna, you're gonna get all these problems right because you are under Ty's watch. That lasted for two weeks. Two, two weeks later, my supervisor calls me to the office and now there's two parents waiting there. And the students are talking about He's so mean. Ty is the meanest teacher ever. He, he doesn't give us any breaks, everything else. After the parent conference, in which, of course, my supervisor covered for me, she sat me down and she asked me, are you ready to actually get some help? And I said, yes, please help me out. And she handed me... <laughs> She handed me the employee manual, which again, I would have gotten the first day if I listened. She told me her horror stories of while working with students. She told me her best practices. And finally she said, all of this is not gonna help if you don't ask for help. I am here to help you, please use me. And from then on, she became one of my biggest mentors in teaching students and I learned to listen. And I've been teaching for seven years and, and now to the point where I even help develop teachers and all of the lesson plans, everything else does not matter if you do not listen and do not get some help. So thank you for listening to the story of my ego and my unfriendly ego. Thank you. Thank you, Ty, for zooming in from Baltimore. And we are coming to the end of the show. One more storyteller. And I want to thank a few people at this moment. The Goethe Institute, thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you to Ketcha, thank you to Michael and to Peter for making this happen, for instigating it. And, um, and thanks to the CONFAB team, most of whom are here. Um, Lucas and Smriti, Michelle, Sarah, Francesca, we're all part of the confabulation uh, family. So, um, so it was a really nice opportunity for all of us to get together here. Um, thanks again to the webcasting team. And the last storytelling storyteller of the evening is Sarah Malika, a Coptic Egyptian improviser, storyteller, and school teacher. She produces and performs in Color Outside the Lines, a production created out of a desire to see greater representation appear on Montreal's improv stages. Sarah. I walk up the linoleum stairs to church. It was sometime midway through the week in the late afternoon. I was there for teen Christian youth group. I was there early, 
So I thought to myself, why not have a seat and thumb through some teen Christian magazines? I went past muted pastel adverts with inspirational quotes and smiling faces, noting things like, the next WOW worship album will be out soon, which of course was the Christian ripoff of Now Hits. Um, and I just kept going through until I reached this glossy image of a teddy bear sitting on wooden bleachers in a gymnasium with the words, Kanye West, Jesus Walks, out now. And something about this image just really captured my attention because to be honest, I found it very cute. <laughs> I was like, wow, this bear has some whimsy to it and I just wanna know more about him. So much so that the next day I hopped on my bike, went over to the local mall, made my way to the department store where there was a CD section and thought to myself, even though I'm looking for a Christian CD and I'll never find it in a mainstream store, I'm just gonna have a look through the case and <gasps> Kanye West, here he is. I flipped over the back to look at the track listing and there was another picture of this bear just going through ginormous wooden doors and stepping into the light. And I was like, I must know about this fantastical bear adventure. So I did notice that there was a parental guidance explicit content sticker on it, but I didn't think much of it. I was like, if the main song on this album is called Jesus Walks, how outside of my straight and narrow path of piety could it really be? So I purchased it, I pedaled as fast as I could home, I went up to my room, I looked for my CD player, I plopped the CD in, and you know there was that like satisfying click as it went in. I put on my headphones and I got ready to worship Jesus. <laughs> the first track on the album starts with a little sketch actually of a school administrator saying, Kanye, can you write something nice for the kids to sing at graduation? And Kanye says, why, well, I've got the perfect thing for them. And the track starts with angelic children's voices singing, drug dealing just to get by, stack your money till it gets sky high. <laughs> and my jaw dropped and my eyes got as wide as they could possibly get as Kanye continued, kids sing, kids sing. We wasn't supposed to make it past 25. Joke's on you, we still alive. Throw your hands up in the sky and say, we don't care what people say. This was not what I was expecting and I loved it. It was so surprising to me and at that age it felt so funny and smart and there was just something about it that felt so authentic to me. And the more I listened to this album, the more I encountered all of these interesting tracks with interesting samples, talking about things like insecurity and racism, both the way that it's overt and the way that we internalize it and about how systemic oppression leads to cyclical poverty. And I had always gone to schools that really praised white and Western knowledge and culture above all else. Of course, I was told to get to know other kids or know things about other cultures, but this was the first time that somebody was so candidly expressing to me that one can come to hate themselves in favor of whiteness. Not only that, when I got to the track Jesus Walks, especially when Kanye says, I want to talk to God, but I'm afraid because uh, we haven't spoken so long. It was honestly for me one of the first times I felt like somebody was being real with me about their faith. I'd heard other Christians saying that they'd felt like they'd strayed from Christianity, but they'd say things like, because I haven't read my Bible for like a week. And this was the first time I felt someone was being really genuine about wanting to place their hope on something greater than themselves, but really struggling with balancing that in their lives. So I listened to that album from start to finish in one sitting, and it felt like my brain just exploded with creative happiness. Like, this is what music can be. It just felt really raw and innovative and fun to me in that moment. As a teenager at that time, I really wanted to meet some kind of positive standard. I really wanted people to look favorably upon me and Christianity felt like the route for that at the time. 
So I don't know if I would have picked up the album if I knew the contents of it. It was a mistake. Um, but I wanted to know about this bear and I wanted to feel good even if it didn't necessarily speak to me in any way. But instead, I felt less alone than I ever had. Instead, I felt connected with parts of myself that I had never explored. So maybe Jesus was at church that day. Thank you. So spontaneously, I'm here, and I would love for everybody to come up, not all at the same time, one at a time, come and take a bow, because, you know, we're all dressed up, we're all out, and, um, yeah, let's do it. Francesca Escara, thank you. Uh. Angelina Davidova from St. Petersburg, who's in bed, thank you. Sarah Morley. Thank you. Christopher Klobel, also probably in bed. Thank you. Maybe not, maybe not. Thank you. Sriti Bansal. Yay! Lucas, Lucas Roland. Ah! Uh. Watch your head on the beam. O'Query Odor, thank you for your video. Um, Michelle Lux. <laughs> Woo! Ty Coleman. Ty Coleman, if you're there, thank you. And finally, Sarah Malika. <laughs> OK, that's it. Um, thanks to the Goethe confabulation. And um, may, we collab may, may we collaborate again. Good night, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Sorry. All right. Look right into the camera and show us the pose that you created. Scream with your face right there. You did. Ooh. <laughs> uh oh. We're going to scream now. My Jeff. A British man who took on a goat's eye view of the world has been rewarded for his efforts. Because we're all completely trapped inside our own brain, our own perception of the world. Well, I can't make this stuff up. Thomas Thwaites had a set of prosthetic legs built and spent three days living among goats in the Alps. He did it because he, <laughs> he wanted a simpler life. <laughs> and he says it was fascinating. A little bizarre though. Thwaites co-won an IG Nobel Prize for biology with another man who tried living as several different animals. <laughs> The IG Nobel Awards honor research that may seem bizarre <laughs> or amusing, but actually provokes thought. Kevin Ochoa. <laughs> Don't watch the video. You try and read the script. <laughs> I need a Kleenex. <laughs> you guys. Once again, Ashley Simpson. On a Monday, I am waiting. Tuesday, I am
a lot of fun. Succeed in saving it? I can't. Can I say it? No. I would imagine. Can I just give him a little a little taste? I wouldn't say too much, but you can say as much as I mean. Hey, it's your. Let me just say this: like every other Marvel movie, it doesn't end well for the superheroes. That's true, in Marvel it, it doesn't end that well. Somebody always bites or gets really badly hurt. Wait till you see this next one. Everybody dies. Do, 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 do. Not everybody. No. Is that? No. Alien, whatever. Can we rewind that part? Yeah, yeah. Can we re you'll cut that, that That's part. Not As these temperatures drop here, they are worried about the slush freezing up. Part of Metro's emergency plan includes an overflow emergency shelter for the homeless and people stranded in the storm. It's at the farmer's market, and our Mark Bellinger was there, just there, Mark. Oh, uh, you're going to do a spoken word for us now, right? Right. And uh, tell us what we're about to hear. It's just a freestyle. Okay. I'm just going to think it up as freestyle. I Freestyle. Well, let me sit back. Go ahead, Marshall. Okay. Years ago, they tried to, years ago, they tried to put me in the, uh, this is a lie. Mm -hmm. Did you want to try to read something from your book? Yeah. Hi, you're looking for someone who has more than just a focus on uh, technology. You're looking for someone who has... That's okay, go for it, tell us, just speak to me. Talk, like we're sitting at the dinner table. Go ahead, Richard, what do you have? What can you offer? That... That's okay, regroup for a second, no problem. Okay. Go ahead, take it again. Okay, you're looking for someone who is more than just technology savvy. Someone who has customer focus and international experience. A, pro a person who is a problem solver, analytical, yet still has common sense. I'm that person. I have great customer focus skills and great soft skills. I have the ability to take end-to-end -end ownership of a project and the determination to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Fantastic.